Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 16th annual Signum Fide Lecture. The purpose of Lewis University's Signum Fide Lecture Series is to bring to campus men and women of vision and faith who illuminate issues affecting the church and its people to provide a forum for topics based on church teaching. As you can see from the back of your program, Lewis has hosted distinguished theologians and nationally recognized scholars during the past 15 years who have visited our campus and shared their keen insights and wisdom with our community. Tonight is no exception. We are most pleased to have as our keynote speakers, Bill Hutchison and Dr. Christy Traina. Bill and Christy will share their personal and collective stories about Christ's call to unity, the imperatives of ongoing reform, and implications for the one Eucharist that binds us. Their presentation tonight is a fitting way for us to mark the close of this extraordinary 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Bill and Christy, thank you for being with us this evening. In a moment, Dr. Katherine Johnson will lead us in prayer. She will be followed by Dr. Karen Trimble Alium, Professor and Chair of Theology and the Director of the Women's Studies Program, who will introduce our speakers. At the conclusion of our keynote presentation, Rebecca and Dennis Kremen will assist us with our audience dialogue. Rebecca is a member of Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Naperville, and Dennis is a professor of history here at Lewis and director of our History Center. We'll conclude our evening with closing remarks from Dr. James Burke. So, to begin, and in keeping with tradition here at Lewis, we will begin our gathering this evening with prayer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Johnson, Director of Ecumenical and Interreligious Relations for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, who will lead us in prayer. Dr. Johnson. It is an honor to be asked to be with you this evening for this prayer and to anticipate with you the wonderful time we will have with such thoughtful and reflective people, for it is from such passionate lived lives and deep thoughts that change will come. Our opening prayer tonight will draw on the words of two figures who loved the whole church and who sought reform. One is from the Reformation era and the other Martin Luther King Jr. from the century just past. But let us begin simply with a reminder from a medieval English woman, Julian of Norwich, who is a theologian of the whole church. The greatest honor, she reminds us, that we can give to Almighty God is to live gladly because we live in the knowledge of divine love. Let us pray. Gracious God, source of all in whom we live, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it for the sake of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your church, founded upon your word, that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but to go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended upon us and not as it does upon you. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together and live together until that day when all God's children will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and our God. Amen. Good evening. Happy to see so many people here. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our speakers tonight. 
When they married in 1983, Bill Hutchison and Christy Trena knew that they were signing on for a life of ecumenism. Bill was heading, heading the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, heading to, sorry, not heading, that quick jump, sorry about that, um, to prepare for a life of ordained ministry in the Lutheran Church of America, now part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And Christy was on her way to the University of Chicago Divinity School to begin a career teaching Roman Catholic theology and ethics. They've kept up their conversation and deepened in their appreciation for each other's traditions through raising three children and over more than three decades. They attended both the signing of the original covenant between the Archdiocese of Chicago and the Metropolitan Chicago Lutheran Synod and its renewal on Reformation Day 2018. And they have been active members of Evanston Reformation 500 and Beyond, a grassroots group uniting Lutherans and Catholics in mutual understanding, community, work, and worship. Christy Trena is professor and chair of religious studies at North, Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. She is the author of Feminist Ethics and Natural Law, The End of the Anathemas in 1998, and Erotic Attunement, Sensuality in Relations Between Unequals in 2011. Her current work focuses on children's moral agency in situations where children are out of place, paid work, um, paid labor, unaccompanied migration, politics, and armed conflict, to just name a few. The former president of the Society of Christian Ethics, she teaches courses in Christianity, theology, theory, and ethics, including bioethics. She is also a member of St. Nicholas Roman Catholic Church in Evanston, where she serves as a Eucharistic minister, sacristan, and minister of care. She is also a member of St. Nicholas Gay Lesbian Family and Friends Ministry. Bill Hutchison served as a pastor for 30 years in the Chicago Metropolitan Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Most recently, he was interim senior pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Charles, Illinois. Ordained in 1988, he has served many ELCA churches in the Chicago area. He specialized in interim ministry, supporting congregations through the discernment process of calling a new pastor, and was a member of the Chicago Metropolitan Synod's Interim Ministry Task Force. He is also a trained architect who focuses on greening and updating religious buildings and a woodworker who has designed and created liturgical furnishings for over a dozen congregations and for the ELCA church, church-wide offices. He is on the board of the Lutheran Outdoor Ministry Center in Oregon, Illinois, and is a member of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Evanston. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speakers. It's really a pleasure to be with everyone tonight. We're so grateful to be invited to Lewis, where our niece graduated from college, and where Jim Burke has been a long time friend. I know you all know how kind and generous a person Jim is, and so one always feels wonderfully hosted when he asks you to do something. We are also excited beyond belief that Katherine Johnson is here, in the small world of the ecumenical relations, Katherine Johnson is, I don't know, um, Serena Williams, okay? <laughs> she, <laughs> she is, she is uh, without Katherine Johnson, we would not have Lutheran Catholic agreements to celebrate. And so if in the time of conversation some technical questions come up about where exactly those are, we're going to defer them exactly to Catherine. So we're so honored to have her with us. Thanks so much for having us. Welcome to everybody who's here tonight. And as Christy said already, uh, our niece was here on the swim team a few years ago and graduated, and her fiance was also on the swim team. So 
be careful where you meet. You never know what might happen. So I thought I would just start with our lecture title. And here we are in St. Borromeo Hall. Uh, at one point, it was a worship space. And as you notice, somebody took great care and attention to put nice materials together. The terrazzo floor, I don't know if any of you have ever watched a terrazzo floor being uh, installed. It is a boatload of work. Uh, all this is crushed stone and then resmer pollens that have to be brought in. And you'll notice these aluminum curbing strips. And it all has to be put in place and then ground and then polished and then honed. And it takes probably about a week. And in a place this size, probably it took the better part of a week and a half to two weeks. And then notice these two angled walls on the sides. And the reason I'm going into this is because um, this will be kind of like a thread underneath our talk. I hadn't seen this space before, but as somebody who loves architecture, it just, it's crying out for a comment or two so that it kind of fills in the blanks underneath our talk. You'll see a lot of positive and negative spaces. Uh, you see these forms where it looks like if you folded the one into the other, it would create a flat plane. But by making these ins and outs, these positive and negative spaces, it makes it a much more interesting space. Places where light shadows and you can see hexagon shapes and triangles. So instead of a flat plane, you suddenly have a rich palette of textures and shadows and forms and so forth. And here on the floor, you notice this marble up in front. And then, of course, when they took down the main altar, you're left with, what do we do with the whole and we do not have the money to put in the marble or the terrazzo of back when this was built, so we put in some nice tile. And just so we know, we put it on a different angle to set it off just a little bit. But we leave the lighting above. And again, notice the spaces between the boards, the positive and negative spaces. And then if you look in the back, you see the bricks, where you have the spaces left between the bricks. And I guess where I'm going with all of this is just to suggest that we often think that it's not real if it's not something that's thrusting forward into space. But I submit to you that it's also possible for something to be powerful even when it seems to be retreating into negative space. And that it's the dance between the positive and the negative that sometimes creates the most interesting and creative tension for us to move forward. With that in note, and that in mind, 35 years ago, Christy and I got married, but we had known each other, and I know this is gonna make some of you laugh. This is our engagement picture from back in 1981. We had a long engagement, and this is why we had a picture, because extended family members heard that the date was two years later, and they were trying to figure out, well, who is this other half? So we thought, well, okay, let's make an official engagement. Sort of picture. channel Charles and Diana, for those of you older than 50. <laughs> and believe it or not, this was on a rainy day, an overcast day. So another point of reference that sometimes your best photo photo photographic lighting is on a day that seems blah to you and I who like our sunshine. And we fell in love and decided to exchange our vows. And we didn't know if it would matter very much if one of us was Lutheran and one of us was Catholic. And even though I had decided to go to seminary to seek ordination, that would be me, and the other one decided to become a Catholic theologian, we thought we would just keep pursuing our vocations. And I did that for 30 years. And you notice that it says former reverend. In the Lutheran tradition, when you resign from the roles, you're no longer considered clergy. It's not an indelible kind of thing. It's a very functional sort of thing. So as long as you're serving in a call or you are uh, on leave from that call, whether it be for illness or disability or family leave or graduate study or what have you, you are either considered on the roster in an active way or on leave from call or you're off the roster and that's what I did earlier this summer, is resign after 30 years because I wanted to do more with architecture and carpentry and things of that sort. We really had no idea that this, you can pick which is the positive and which is the negative, <laughs> would have so many impacts in our personal lives and in our shared life together. 
yeah, it really hadn't occurred to us that we were walking into something that was equivalent to the trial separation between Protestants and Catholics that had been going on for 500 years. Um, there's an 800 year plus separation between the Eastern Christians and the Western Christians, but that's another lecture. Um, the single Christian community that God created at the beginning had fallen into such a dispute that the parties could no longer live or eat together at all. The trouble was that people have been living this way for so long that they really had forgotten that they were supposed to be together in the first place. And how did all this happen? Well, in 1517, an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther got upset about some pretty egregious abuses in the Roman Catholic Church. Most of them circled around offering a certain amount of time off from purgatory at a given price. You've probably heard of what was referred to as the sale of indulgences at just the moment the church needed money to build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. So here is Martin Luther supposedly putting up the 95 theses, and 95 theses are basically 95 gripes or beefs or complaints or things that Luther wanted to take issue with in the Catholic Church. And the reason I say suppose it is because he did post them, but we're not sure it was on the outside church doors. We think it might have been on some kind of a bulletin board or kiosk-like structure. The point is that they were made public, but maybe not in such a dramatic fashion as pounding nails through a, you know, some kind of a paper or a parchment on the face of a church. And he wasn't the first to call out these kinds of practices, but he was certainly one of the loudest. And of course, we have to also recognize that he had the advantage of the printing press to help circulate uh, things that he would write and that others would write. Pretty soon, he and the Pope parted ways, along with lots of others, Anglicans, Calvinists, Anabaptists. And it was like glass shattering. And everybody's been living in separate houses and eating at separate tables for most of the last 500 years. And so our talk is to try and say, if we really are still at that place of, at least with Lutherans and Catholics, two tables, even when we're called to one table. So that means the next thing you need, if you've had a separation, you need a marriage counselor. But those weren't invented until recently. About 50 years or so ago, uh, Christians got one. Theologians on all sides, like Katherine Johnson, have been working to really understand each other. And Lutherans and Catholics have reached some doctrinal and theological agreements that are quite impressive about how God forgives sin, about how Christ is present in the Eucharist, other really significant items. But as important as it is to repair all that doctrine, all that theological misunderstanding, which is kind of technical, you need to do some more than that to repair 500 years of bad feeling. Unity across difference depends on building relationships between people. Because only when we have those relationships, right, is the difference painful. Is, do we have a motive to repair the breach? Otherwise, why bother? So over the years, we've come to realize many things about ourselves and about ecumenism in the wider church. For one thing, we've realized that much of the real wisdom with ecumenism needs to be found in marriage because really we're talking about a relationship between people. Yeah, and in hindsight, I think we were really lucky, right? Because the priest who prepared us to get married, Monsignor McGovern, was a by the books, follow the rules person, kind of conservative, even by 1983 standards. But he looked us straight in the eye and he said, in marriage, your relationship comes first. And whatever the churches may be telling you, you need to do, comes second. In other words, don't jeopardize the sacrament of your marriage to follow the rules of the churches. That's right, and it turned out that his own mother was Lutheran. So he, of all people, surprised us that he knew what it was like to grow up in a household with Lutheran and Roman Catholic parents. Another thing we have discovered is that the two of us and our mixed denomination marriage is not nearly as unusual as it felt so long ago 
when we exchanged our vows. There are many, many other couples who fall into this category. So for example, we've already met one couple tonight, and I'm guessing that there are others here. How many would you, of you would fall into a mixed denomination or interfaith marriage? Just raise your hands. So we have a, 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 a significant presence among us here. How many come from households where this was the case? where maybe your parents or somebody that is now married, okay? And how many of you have friends or associates, either through your classes or through your work, who are in such mixed marriages or who come from such families of origin? And now almost everybody's hands in the rooms has gone up. So over the years, we've learned that what felt like a very singular path is actually becoming a very common path. Which means that the kinds of knowledge we have is actually widespread and we should all use it more. Because we've learned that family relationships really aren't rocket science, right? But they take some practice. Right, it can be really hard to negotiate between Catholic fish fries and Lutheran ribbon jello. I have to say that that is better fish than was probably ever seen at a Catholic fish fry, Bill. You're, you're being a little too nice. But, but maybe you've had an experience like this. A little gap opens up between you and somebody in your family. Maybe it's because you voted for Donald Trump and they voted for Clinton, or the reverse, right? Maybe it's about one of you not showing up for the other one for some important moment. And then suddenly, every little thing, every clod of mud on the floor, every unemptied trash can gets thrown into that gap that opened between you. And it makes it wider, and it holds open the gap. And eventually, you feel so far away from each other that you can't even remember ever getting along. And the worst thing is you can't even remember ever wanting to get along. And then one day something happens, right? Your old dog gets sick for the last time, or your neighbors need shelter after a hurricane, or a grandchild or a niece or nephew is born, and there you are hugging each other and crying and wondering why you invested so much energy into being angry that you can hardly remember what drove you apart to begin with. And that's where we seem to be as Christians right now. We've come to realize that we've let the question of who's taking out the trash distract us from linking arms to spread God's love in the world. We're at that moment when we look at each other sheepishly, wondering why we let ourselves waste so much energy on such relatively minor disagreements with people we love. If we're to be God's hands in the world, that world can't afford for us to siphon off the energy that's needed for helping people. People like refugees from weather or persecution or opioid addicts or sexual abuse victims and use it for a distracting fight or even just for reinventing wheels. The challenges and joys that await us when we stick together are so much more significant than the disputes between us. You know, it's kind of amazing that given all of our original naivete and all of our idealism and the high-minded churchiness that we're still married after 35 years. Which, incidentally, is already 7% of the time that Lutherans have been around in the world. Well, well, maybe we have something off to offer then. What do you think? Shall we try? Okay, let's begin at the beginning, the basic ingredients. Okay, shared values. Uh, like loving chocolate? Oh, well, definitely that. Um, that's unifying. I was thinking more about baptism. By the way, Bill built that. Okay, um, but we'll say more about baptism later. There's also covenant, right? Promising to love and support each other until death do us part in sickness and in health and all that stuff? Yeah, Roman Catholics and Lutherans have those too. In the fall of 2016, Lutherans and Catholics worldwide promised, and this is what it said, to deepen our solidarity by drawing close in faith to Christ, by praying together and by listening to one another, by living Christ's love in our relationships. And here you see a slide from Lund, Sweden, 
And of course, everyone recognizes Pope Francis in front, but then if you look off to the right, you see in the middle uh, Bishop Antje Jacklin, who is a bishop of Sweden. And so I guess this is just a reminder to us that um, what is a concept in some traditions can be a lived reality in other traditions. We've had an official ecumenical covenant in Chicago for quite some time, and we actually beat Rome on that. We signed it in 1989, and it was at St. Alphonsus Catholic Church, and here is uh, retired Bishop Sherman Hicks in the upper left, in the right-hand side of that upper left picture, and that's the original covenant from 1989 that was processed in. And then on the lower right, you see a picture of last year's Reformation celebration at Holy Name Cathedral in downtown Chicago, and there you see uh, Cardinal uh, Supich and Bishop Miller signing and renewing that same covenant uh, 28 years later. Which was a really exciting day for the Catholics because Lutherans can actually sing. Uh, so I guess that means we're on our second honeymoon now, right? Yeah, but you know, life can get rough on the days when we're not dressing up and singing and eating cookies or jello together. Yeah, bad stuff can happen and tempers can fray. We have to really trust each other and we have to respect each other and be able to have confidence that the other person's acting in good faith. I'm remembering a time when that wasn't true, uh, when your ordination committee straight up told us that a Catholic wife could not support her Lutheran husband as a pastor. It really wasn't much fun feeling like a liability in that moment, and I didn't feel like it was fair that you were being punished for me either. That's just one example of the ways in which when Christians are so focused on protecting our own particular sort of Christianity, our own store brand, kind of, we end up disrespecting each other. That's why the complement to criticism ratio that some of you may have heard about is so important. If we offer six genuine compliments for every criticism we make, our partner feels valued and respected. But if we get stuck in criticism mode, that's never happened to either <laughs> of us, uh, then they don't. All the more reason for Lutherans and Catholics to look hard for each other's strengths and mention them a lot. Then the differences don't seem so large. Music. Is what Lutherans are great at. Prayer tradition are, is something Catholics are good at. Preaching. Social justice. Scripture. Tradition. Reform. And ritual. And fish fries and bingo. And ribbon, jello, and quilting. Really, though, life is so much richer when we can draw all these gifts. We've always called it stereo. Like right and left earbud. Without both channels, something sounds like it's missing. It's the same music with a slightly different emphasis or perspective on each channel. So the other important thing about covenants is that they're a promise to lean on each other in hard times like the time you had a concussion. Or when you almost cut off your finger. Or when your young, younger brother had a stroke. Or when you have felt deep discouragement about the church. Right. I'm also thinking about when the church gets itself into a jam, though. Um, for instance, in the 16th century, Martin Luther was trying to rescue us all from believing that one of the best ways to heaven was sending the pope money so he could build St. Peter's. All right, now with the sex abuse crisis, right? It's not just a matter of bad luck for Catholics and good luck for Lutherans. Lutherans have a lot of checks and balances, and they discourage abuse and they encourage reporting. And we just don't have as many in the Catholic Church. We could really use the advice and companionship of Lutherans on this one. And Lutherans, yes, they are allowed to use one of their criticism tickets on it too. And Catholics can really help us Lutherans to develop a, and involve into a deeper appreciation for how ritual and liturgy can lead to a deeper communal prayer life for Christians gathered in worship. Catholics can also help Lutherans to develop practices outside of worship that help mark the church year and its various seasons of repentance, anticipation, and celebration 
through disciplines such as meditation, fasting, daily prayer, and worship. Getting back to that Martin Luther point, though, sometimes conflict goes beyond six compliments and a criticism. Pope Leo X actually kicked Martin Luther out of the church, and Luther ended up having to go into hiding. Now, this is an artist's rendering of this papal edict, this papal bull, and it wasn't the situation where Luther was standing there hearing this read aloud to him. It was all handled by letters uh, written in Latin, of course, but the artist is trying to draw the moment and the tension and the controversy and the fact that the public is watching, if you see in the background there, so that what happened really mattered to more than just Luther and Leo. Right. So Leo kicked Luther out, but before that happened, Leo wrote this amazingly sarcastic letter to Leo that even Stephen Colbert could not match pretending to accuse Leo's true enemies when he was really furious with Leo. He did not fool Leo. So here's a small sampling of this heated exchange between Luther and Leo. Is it not true that there is nothing under the vast heavens more corrupt, more pestilential, more hateful than the court of Rome? Behold, Leo, my father, with what purpose and on what principle it is that I have stormed against that seat of pestilence. I am so far from having felt any rage against your person that I even hope to gain favor with you and to aid your, you in your welfare by striking actively and vigorously at that, your prison, nay, your hell, Rome. You can see why Luther wasn't the most popular <laughs> at the Vatican. <laughs> And let's not forget all the arrests, ex executions, and wars. The split between Catholics and Protestants hasn't been just a spat. It's been an international military and diplomatic crisis, even today. Think about the troubles between the Protestant Northern Ireland and Catholic Republic of Ireland and the trickiness of the Brexit negotiations. I mean, that's true. We haven't had any wars or executions in our house yet. Um, <laughs> But so far, but working through disagreements can take a lot of negotiating. We have to really talk over the hard stuff in detail and pray over it and sometimes get help from somebody else. Sometimes we've even felt like giving up on it. But when we stick to it, we always get to a better place. Blowing, up, blowing it up to the scale of the churches, it's taken over 50 years and whole teams of theology professors and theologians like Katherine Johnson, who's with us, to reach agreement on some important things and even to explain exactly what stands in the way of agreeing on others. Okay, but we're starting to give people the idea that this whole ecumenical thing is really a drag, like a few talking heads meeting in conference centers every couple of years for a theological jousting match. That would be really too bad. Right. And here's a good place to take another lesson from relationships. Just as we need at least six compliments for every criticism, we need at least that many dates for every tough conversation. And someday, instead of just talking to parties, Lutherans and Catholics, perhaps we'll be talking not just ecumenically, but interfaith. OK, so what counts as an ecumenical date? Bible study, prayer group, social service projects, retreats? Sure, those are all really important, but let's have some pure fun too, like a, how about a Lutheran Catholic trivia game? Or a concert? Or getting together over beers to sing, yes, a mighty fortress is our God. Pa-boom, 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 yeah. Geeky fun, but nonetheless fun. Right, I mean, a relationship that's all negotiation and seriousness won't last very long. The point is to build a life together. And that means finding a way to deal with the fact that our partners aren't perfect. They do really inconsiderate things at times, and it can really get hard to believe that they still love us. Hey, speak for yourself. I don't like being called out in public. I wouldn't call you out in public. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I overreacted. I realize it can be pretty hard to live with. And I'm sorry. I was completely insensitive just a moment ago. I didn't think how it would make you feel to hear that. You know, it works so much better when we're self-critical and apologize for our own feelings rather than waiting for the other person to point them out. Nobody likes to be cornered, even when they're really in the wrong. Maybe Lutherans and Catholics have gotten wiser over the past 500 years? They certainly weren't following that rule in the 16th century or even in the middle of the 20th century, but in 2017, together we said with the common statement, quote, we beg forgiveness for our failures and for the ways in which Christians have wounded the body of the Lord and offended each other during the 500 years since the beginning of the Reformation until today. And there's a lot to confess and forgive. Let's be honest, there's a lot more to confess and forgive on the Catholic side than the Lutheran side. One good place to start was admitting how many things Luther had been right about. And not just admitting that, but being grateful for it. The statement says both churches are very thankful for the spiritual and theological gifts received through the Reformation. In other words, where would Catholics be without Luther? Well, but let's not forget that Lutherans persecuted other Christian believers, and we need to ask for forgiveness for that, too. Right. Ask forgiveness, reconcile, and then move on. Otherwise, we tend to forget what the covenant says, and that's that we have, what we have in common is still far more than what divides us. When the rubber hits the road, it can be tough. We have to stand up for each other in uncomfortable situations. That's really true, and one of my biggest failings is how slow I've been to learn that. I'm really a lot like my church in that respect. So I'm gonna tell a little story, a little thought experiment for you all. Imagine you've been seeing somebody for a while and you're ready to take the next big step, which is inviting, let's say, inviting her to your family's home for Thanksgiving dinner. So she rings the doorbell and there are welcomes, there are hugs all around. You sit down, you watch the Macy's parade, you start in on a football game, everybody's getting along and you start to relax. It's going well, right? She feels welcome. But then when it's time to carve the turkey, you notice the table has six chairs, one for mom, one for dad, one for brother, one for sister, one for you, one for a girlfriend, right? And five plates. So you go to your dad, you say, hey, we're not finished setting the table, we need another plate. And he says, well, your girlfriend is not part of this family yet. If you get married eventually, she'll be welcome to eat with us. But for now, she can watch us have dinner, if she likes, and then she can go and grab a bite at her house. And would you say, in that situation, oh, okay, I see, and then pull your girlfriend aside and say, uh, explain what's going on and expect her to kind of nod politely all through the pumpkin pie, no, <laughs> if you really loved her, if you even liked her a tiny bit, right? You'd insist on the sixth plate or you would go get your coat and her coat and you would go over to the other side of town to eat with her family because they're more hospitable. And then there would be quite an argument with your parents when you got home, right? In either case, you would think twice about inviting her home again to your house and she would think more than twice about accepting the invitation. But that missing plate moment happens every day across the world when our Lutheran and other Protestant brothers and sisters visit Catholic churches. They're not supposed to receive the Eucharist because Catholics and other Christians are not married yet. It's not very surprising that people get pretty miffed at their own and others' families as a result of that. Despite what I've just said, though, and here's what I mean about learning slowly, 
I went along with this practice for almost 35 years. It's kind of amazing that this guy stuck through me, stuck with me through that, right? That was pretty bad behavior. I have to say, forgiveness and forbearance. This is the, this is the test case right here. Now, when I know that someone in my Catholic church can't receive communion, when I recognize them there, I don't receive it either. During Advent and Lent, I don't receive at all, in solidarity with all the Christians who are not welcome at the Catholic table. It's a little thing, but then actually, life is made up of little things. And uh, despite our making small steps forward, there are still a lot of lingering, painful memories. Right, it takes a, hard a long time to get over them. I remember your mom never got over the fact that her Catholic best friend couldn't be the maid of honor at her wedding because her best friend's priest told her that it would be a sin to even put her foot in a Lutheran church. So she, not only was she not the maid of honor, but she didn't even come. And then my whole family hasn't gotten over the fact that my parents' bishop wouldn't let you participate as a member of the clergy at my dad's funeral. Not to mention that dad's spiritual director, who was a nun, wasn't allowed to give the homily because she's a woman. That was a pretty painful day for everyone, and I don't mean to make a joke of death, but it was a funeral already, right? It was hard. I think we're giving them the impression that we spend most of our time being depressed about Catholics excluding Lutherans and about not being able to take communion together. That would be quite a downer. They're going to think that we are born and bred whiners. Get it? Okay. Yeah. It would be a drag to spend our whole lives focusing on what we disagree about. Or what we don't both like, right? For instance, I'm remembering that time you took me roller skating. I spent about half an hour in the kiddie rink, and I couldn't get past the stage of marching on skates like this, right? And every time I tried to roll, I landed on my seat. So it was really nice to notice, of you to notice that I was having an awful time. And from then on, no roller skating. We take walks, we go to movies, we play cards, we go biking, we hike. Yeah, and I finally told you how much I dislike Swiss chard. Neither one of us has brought any home from the grocery store recently. So yeah, there's little steps of uh, things changing here and there. We're concentrating our love instead on Brussels sprouts, <laughs> broccoli, asparagus, green beans. You get the picture. Yeah. I mean, sometimes not receiving communion feels like giving up. But sometimes pretty amazing things happen when we do it. Recently, when we went to Mass in my parish, we went up with our arms folded at communion time. Sorry. And the priest, who's known us for over 20 years, put his hand on our heads and said, may you share in the body and blood of Christ. We got to receive communion without the bread and wine. And that was really a gift. And sometimes you just have to laugh about things. In 1989, when we were invited to the first Chicago Lutheran Roman Catholic Covenant service at St. Alphonsus, it was a big deal, invitation only, made all the more so because Illinois' premier Lutheran Catholic couple at the time, Senator Paul Simon and his wife, Jean Simon, were coming along with Cardinal Bernardin and Bishop Sherman Hicks. We got really dressed up. You wore a black suit and a Roman collar and I had on heels, so you held my hand up all those steps at St. Alphonsus. But unfortunately, outside the church were a little group of protesters who were heckling the holy Roman Catholics who were joining up with those heathen Lutherans. They wanted to stop it, so they turned to Bill and shouted, Father, Father! <laughs> It seems they were much more upset about Roman Catholics cooperating with Lutherans than they were about a celibate priest holding hands with a woman in public. <laughs> we have laughed about that one a lot. <laughs> but there's one more important message here for Catholics. There are almost 1.5 billion Catholics in the world and only 80 million Lutherans. In this case, Catholics are the elephant and Lutherans are the mouse. 
So here you've been seeing this uh, graphic of the world map, and the circles are representing the uh, relative population of Christians around the world. And so you see the, the largest circle is in the United States. In terms of its population, the percentage is uh, predominantly Christian. And then you notice a second large one that's just a little bit off the map in Brazil. And then you notice a third large circle in Mexico, and then a fourth one over there in Russia, and, uh, and so forth and so on. And this comes from the Pew Research Council. And here is the t actual data table. So you see US, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, and then the top 10, which constitute just under half of all Christians across the globe. And then you see that at this time, this is from 2011. If you see at the very, very bottom there, December 2011, uh, just under uh, 1.2 million, excuse me, 1.2 billion, uh, uh, excuse me, around the world. So uh, this is just a kind of a distribution to show that, in fact, the Catholic Church is the big uh, player in all of this. And here is another graphic to show the 10 countries with the largest number of Catholics. And interestingly, it's not the US. It's Brazil, followed by Mexico, followed by the Philippines, followed by the United States, and so on. And there you see just under 1.1 billion. Of course, this was 2011, so seven years ago. So things have continued to grow in the Catholic Church since then. And then here, by contrast, are the 10 countries with the largest number of Protestants. Not surprisingly, the US is very large in that respect. And you can see that it's um, uh, 308 million plus the 491, so it's under a billion. So it's altogether still smaller than the Catholic uh, presence, almost by one to two ratio. Mm -hmm. But Lutherans are just a small piece of that. And so even though we are a small piece, I'd like to think that we're a, a mighty mouse. Yes, fair enough. But Catholics are the heavyweights in this situation. And when you're the big guy, you hold the power. And you call the shots. Lutherans recognize Catholic ordination and Catholic Eucharistic theology. They're just about ready to end the trial separation and move back into a, a, a house-sharing situation, right? But they can't make Catholics do anything. Meanwhile, Catholics don't fully recognize Lutheran ordination, mainly because of the widespread ordination of women in the Lutheran Church, and also a different understanding of how, the, how apostolic tradition and power are passed down in ordination. And that means we Catholics need to agitate a little with our higher-ups. It's only partly a matter of popes and bishops. It's also a matter of everyday actions. So just how often do you in this room, if you're Catholic or if you're not Catholic, have you heard this and wondered? How often do Catholics in this room say Catholic when they really mean Christian? How often do Catholics reach out to nearby churches of all varieties when they want to plan a youth event or a service project instead of contacting just the Catholic parishes? How often do Catholics take the initiative inviting other Christians to collaborate or pray or go to Great America, right? What kind of force for good might we be in the world if we all work together? On the international level, level um, Caritas and the LWF World Service have already pledged to collaborate in these ways, but we can do a lot on the ground locally. So if, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, if we can do so much together without sharing a table, what's wrong with a separate but equally valid approach to Eucharist or Holy Communion? And as a partial answer to that, we can return to our font to be reminded that there's just one baptism. Uh, there's no such thing as being baptized Catholic, really, or being baptized Lutheran, really. We're baptized Christian into the body of Christ, period. As Pope Francis told a Catholic woman with a Lutheran husband, we have the same baptism. We must walk together. We have one Jesus Christ who lived and healed and taught in this one world, who died and rose for everyone. While we're at it, we have one Creator who made us and our world and our universe, and we have one Holy Spirit who promises to bless and inspire one Christian community. 
which tells us, by the way, that the Holy Spirit is standing ready to help us make that true. It's not easy. Back in the days, the early days of the church, even Peter and Paul, whom the Bible tells us were both really obstinate and often a bit misguided, needed a lot of help to stay on the same page. But if the Spirit helped those crazy guys, we can be sure the Spirit is here to help us too. What kind of witnesses are we to our faith if we aren't drawing on the grace of the Holy Spirit to heal the divisions between us? If Christians, with the grace of baptism and common priorities and beliefs, can't find ways to get along at the same dinner party despite our differences, then how can we expect anyone else to do so? And why would anyone else invited to a dinner party like ours want to even accept the invitation? That's why Pope Francis, as well as the bishops of Germany, have suggested that inter-church couples could take communion together. But if they can... Why not everyone else? I mean, that's a really good question. One of the Lutheran Church's great insights is that just as food is an answer to physical hunger and a way of showing hospitality at home, the Eucharist is an answer to spiritual hunger and a way of showing hospitality at church. Even Francis suggested that instead of being the end of a path, of the churches officially reaching full agreement in some distant future time, sharing the Lord's Supper now might be the food that we need for the long, imperfect process of learning to walk together. Francis agrees with Luther. He said, the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine medicine and nourishment for the weak. Now, that's pretty important because the likelihood of two human beings ever reaching complete agreement is just about zero. Still, we don't say, we can't get married until we agree on absolutely everything. And if we ever disagree on anything, we need to divorce, right? So on the larger scale of the churches, imagine getting millions of people to agree perfectly. It would be really awful if we couldn't even share a meal together on the way. We definitely need that medicine and nourishment. So here you see a very familiar traditional version of the Last Supper. And uh, when I was a interim pastor at Pilgrim Lutheran Church in the Ravenswood neighborhood of Chicago, they have a a Lutheran school there from preschool through eighth grade and uh, Wednesday chapel every week. And we moved away the altar the freestanding altar that was blocking the front altar. And on the front altar was a carved marble relief panel of this Last Supper. It it didn't have the color, it was just all monochromatic, but it had everybody on the one side of the table as we see in in this rendition. And I posed a question to the students. Is that the way you guys eat at home? You all sit on one side of the table and then there's just this other side that's all open like that? I said, why do you think the artist would do this? And I actually hadn't thought what the answer was until it popped into my head right at that moment. And I said, is it possible that the artist is suggesting that the Eucharist is the Last Supper, Christ's sign of the rest of us being invited to the table because there's still an open side to the table for others to gather? And all of a sudden, a kindergartner sitting over here on the front piped up and said, oh, I get it. It's as if we're there. So lest some of us fool ourselves into thinking that since we have not directly created this problem of church-wide brokenness and incompletely shared Eucharistic celebration, that somehow we bear no responsibility for making things better. Here is something we learned this past summer. We were in Sarajevo, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and as many of you know, in the 1990s, Sarajevo was under siege for nearly four years with an average of over 350 Serbian shells raining down on the city every day. And when I say shells, I'm not talking about little 38s. I'm talking about things that would be uh, large enough uh, that your paper towel roll 
would be uh, similar size. And that's why you see such large pockmarks here. This was for nearly four years. And there are some paint marks that have been put on pavement where blasts scattered across the pavement. And this is to remind themselves of the violence and horror that they never want to experience again. They call them Sarajevo roses. A small group of young adults has realized that overcoming a bad past takes much more than saying never again. They call themselves Youth for Peace. They had nothing to do with the war because many of them were toddlers when it happened and some weren't even born during that time. Still, they know that going forward, real peace demands real community and requires creating intimate relationships across what had been a violent divide. So they bring Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and Muslims from across the city to share stories, drink coffee, and get to know each other. While they had nothing to do with the war, still they say, our job is to fix what we didn't break. And that's our work too among Christians. We weren't there when the church split up 501 years ago. God didn't break it up. Our ancestors did. So our job is to fix what we didn't break. Our job is to put the church back together. Another reason to put the church back together is that we need hope for unity and community outside the church. Right now, healing political division seems impossible. Red and blue are way too allergic to even slight shadings of purple. Climate protectors and economic development advocates see each other as arch enemies. You're either pro-Zionist or pro-Palestinian. There's no middle ground. It's hard to agree on processes that aren't biased against either victims of sexual abuse and harassment or the people they accuse of hurting them. In all these cases, we get stuck because we can't see any common ground, and we start assuming that there can never be any. Well, actually, in all these cases, we really do have a lot in common, and our future welfare really is interdependent. But it's so tempting to turn our backs on each other because then we can be right. We get the momentary luxury of enjoying a good tantrum, and we enjoy the temporary freedom of not even having to try to work together. As Christians, we don't have this luxury. We're stuck together, believing in Jesus, the same Jesus. And we're stuck together, believing in baptism and Eucharist, the same baptism and Eucharist. So we're committed to not just believing together, but being together. Even in those moments, or years, or even centuries, when we don't quite feel like it, kind of like marriage. The secret is that we have some pretty amazing graces to draw on. That is, pretty amazing gifts from God that we don't create, but that carry us through. One is love. Love is the divine point of view, a God's eye view, really. Love like that helps us to delight in and cherish and even forgive each other. Despite all of our bumps, despite all of our warts and real mistakes and occasional outright meanness. And it helps us to cherish and to forgive ourselves also, by the way, when we, are, when we see ourselves from God's perspective. Another one is faith, our trust that God's love really is there, which gives us a habitude of gratitude for all the times we've experienced it directly as well as through others. It's not just a statement like a creed, but a deep, abiding confidence that when we gather in and around God's love, God is really with us, renewing us, forgiving us, empowering us. And then there's hope. And I think that many people think of hope as a wish, like a wish for unity, or hope as a bargain. Like if we work really hard, then we'll see unity in our lifetimes or we'll get whatever it is we want because God guarantees that. But for me, hope is confidence that by being church, by being in a loving relationship, by acting as if we're already unified, by acting as if we're already not in tension, we'll eventually become what God meant us to be in the first place. 
In the end, ecumenism is just making the hidden unity of Christ's church visible to the rest of the world. But it's not something to do in our spare time after we've balanced the church budget and planned the Easter services. It's also not something we can leave to the bishops and theologians. It's part of our shared central Christian witness. It's one of our first, not last, tasks. Along with Lutheran World Federation, Bishop Munin, Muni Yunnan and Pope Francis, we commit ourselves to continue our journey together, guided by God's Spirit, toward the day when everyone will gather, however imperfectly, around the same table. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Jim Burke um, for inviting Rebecca and I. Um, we're the Catholic Lutheran um, um, couple here as well. Um, and I um, want to kind of throw open um, the floor to some questions. But one of the things I wanted to think about was, um, Bill, within the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, there is an openness of the, the Eucharist to all who are uh, attending the service. Could you just to, to talk about um, that position um, that the, 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 that particular Lutheran Church has made? So uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, as uh, was alluded to before by um, Karen, uh, was a relatively new denomination that was formed in 1988 out of three previous church bodies. We call them the PCBs, predecessor church bodies. It's a little bit of an inside joke, you know, PCBs being those uh, toxic things in our environment. And they were more regional expressions of Lutheranism, and so the ELCA was really the first time that you had the Norwegian, the Swedish, the Finnish, the German, the Prussian, the various uh, strands of Lutheranism from the old world finally under one national umbrella. There were signs of that before with the three previous bodies, but it was really the ELCA that kind of signaled to each other that we were moving forward in a new way. And uh, one of the things that uh, the ELCA has always championed is what we call open communion, meaning that anyone who's baptized and uh, has a sense of Christ being present in this meal is welcome to come forward to receive. And they don't need to be a member of the Lutheran Church. They could be Episcopalian, they could be Catholic, they could be Baptist, they could be Presbyterian, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I have to also say at the same time that I say this, that the ELCA, while it's uh, one of the largest Lutheran groups, is not the only Lutheran group. Uh, one of the sad things about Lutheranism is that we are still, uh, despite coming together, forming a new denomination signaling Lutheran unity, we still have significant separation. And so some of you hear the term Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which sounds confusing because it's like, here's a national church that's called a, has the name Synod, and then you have these uh, regional expressions of the ELCA, like the Chicago Metropolitan Synod and the Synod of uh, the Caribbean and so forth and so on. The Missouri Synod Church has a very different understanding of communion practice. There they understand communion as that which is not just members of the Lutheran, church, of the Lutheran tradition, but members of that specific congregation. So that when they have communion, it's only those members and occasionally guests who come from outside. But technically and, and uh, classically, they're supposed to speak to the pastor ahead of time to signal their intention to take communion. So it's a very different understanding. So the point of all that is just to say that while we Lutherans have on one hand a very liberal, open, welcoming sense of the table fellowship, we also have a very uh, narrow and uh, tightly defined, and we have a whole range in between. Um, thank you. Uh, any other questions um, from the group here gathered? Mine's super theological, um, not. Um, I wondered if at some point in your marriage there was a conversation about Christy becoming Lutheran or Bill becoming Catholic, like if that 
conversation. I mean, you're obviously both extremely committed to your own tradition, but I just wondered if you ever navigated that. Well, um, the problem with Bill becoming Catholic was that he had to choose between, if he wanted to be a pastor, he had to choose between being Catholic and single and Lutheran and married. So that one wasn't going anywhere. Um, I think the conversation about me becoming Lutheran happens about every five years um, with equal amount of frequency at his instigation and mine. So <laughs> he gets discussed. He gets discussed. And just as a side note, our children, uh, we have two daughters and a son, and they re rebelled. Uh, oftentimes, Lutheran churches are smaller, and uh, you've heard of PKs, pastor's kids, or preacher's kids. And if you can imagine being a teacher's kid, it's like being in a fishbowl environment in a smaller congregation. None of our kids signed up for that, and so they weren't too thrilled about being part of the Lutheran tradition. And given that we have some headstrong daughters who take after their feminist mom, uh, they weren't too eager to sign up for a tradition that would not recognize women's ordination. So they rebelled by going off to the Methodist church. <laughs> um, were your parents accepting of your relationship? You want to go? Um, mine... Mine had questions, but they kept them to themselves. But My mom in particular had questions, and she, being the person that she was, did not keep them to herself. <laughs> <laughs> um, she felt like I was, um, to put it in a sort of blunt way, barking up the wrong tree. And especially as a, somebody who was aspiring to be a pastor at that point, uh, just adding to a sense of challenge. Um, but I have to also say that later on in her life, after her second husband died uh, and her first husband being my father, um, she was ill enough that she needed to be with family, and so we had her under our, our roof for five years. And it took her a while, but she finally got to a point where she no longer worried about that difference, and she didn't hold it against Christy any longer that she wasn't quote-unquote Lutheran. So, even in some of the most uh, outspoken situations, there can be a change of the hardening of one's heart. And some of it I ascribe to my mother's uh, very awkward experience of her best friend not being able to participate in her wedding. And she finally was able to kind of let go of that. And actually, for a time, she was living up in Canada, and there was no Lutheran church, so she actually attended the Catholic church. So <laughs> there you have it. Um, hi, how do you guys, um, how do you two go about celebrating Catholic or Lutheran holidays? We, well, most of them are the same. Um, Catholics have some feast days that Lutherans don't tend to celebrate. Um, and we probably do it differently every year, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of our favorite traditions is going to the Easter Vigil at St. Nicholas Church in Evanston, which lasts about, I don't know, Jim, what is it, four or five hours, right? People take pillows and thermoses and things to this, and, uh, and we would always take our kids and go. Um, so we, we, celebrate, we, we do our best to celebrate them together, um, but we don't always celebrate them in exactly the same way every year. Is that fair? And I think we've learned from each other to appreciate, you know, what it is to give up something in Lent, for example. Uh, that's not something that, uh, at least back when I was a child, was a very prominent uh, emphasis in, in at least the strand of Lutheranism that I grew up in. I know it, that in some strands of Lutheranism there is that. And um, probably, I think you, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would say that you've learned that you can actually have meaningful worship that doesn't necessarily always have to have the Eucharist at it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's some learning across the traditions. The, 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 one, the one holiday that really, was really tough until about last year was Reformation Sunday. I wasn't a big fan of that one. <laughs> Too often Lutherans end up doing a kind of a guerrilla, you know, <laughs> aren't we great that we were the ones that kind of, you know, broke the mold on starting the Reformation and really there's... Uh, if you look at history, Jan Hus, who was uh, from what would now be the Czech Republic, uh, that area of Eastern Europe, 
about 100 years before Luther was already talking about similar things. And so we Lutherans have to realize that we weren't the first out of the blocks to really start to bring to light some of the criticisms that needed to be spoken. And if it wasn't Jan Hus or if it wasn't uh, Luther, it would have been somebody else. It was just that kind of a ripeness for change to happen. My friends, um, have, have you, have each of you been denied communion in the other tradition? Yes, for me. I haven't. And that's what's one of the awkward things. Yeah, I haven't. Lutherans always welcome those who believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So I haven't been denied. I've sometimes, um, I've sometimes refused, but I haven't been denied. Hello. Uh, so I work here in the campus ministry department, and so I just thank you for this. This has been fun to hear and to just hopefully bring back some of this to our conversations with our students. And But one question I had, uh, which I was really intrigued by, is the, the idea of not receiving as a Catholic in the Catholic Church, as you, as you named, when you are aware of someone who would not be uh, allowed and going up for just a blessing. Uh, we've been asking our students to ask questions about Mass, and often on Sunday nights, I would say 30 to 40 percent of the students who are at our Catholic Mass are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess my question is, how did the community, the Catholic community of, of the church that you go to, um, respond, or how do they, your, your friends, your colleagues uh, respond when, when they see that, uh, you know, and, and how might, I don't know, we, I, this is a harder question, but bring that and to enlighten our students to have that question, or to, to wrestle with that. I think, first of all, I think it's always an interesting question how, to ask the students how they feel if they are served food at an event, for instance, and other people are not served. And just to ask them to explore that, right? Um, but in my case, one of the benefits of it is that people often ask me. There was a Sunday on, on Reformation Sunday in 2017, a local Lutheran pastor who didn't have, during that hour of the morning, a service to be at, came and joined us because of the Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogues at St. Nicholas. And I saw her in her red jacket for Reformation, and I thought, Pastor Betty's not going to be able to receive. And I was scheduled to be a Eucharistic minister that morning. So it was very public that I went up as a Eucharist, Eucharistic minister like this. Like, no. <laughs> and so what happens then is that people ask me. And I can ha then I can talk about it, right? So it creates an opportunity. It's really kind of a gift. And so in, it's a self-denial in one sense, but it's also an opportunity for a discussion and for a deepening in the other sense. So in that way, it's a blessing. Okay. Just for convenience, I'm going to go here first, then there. <laughs> Thank you. So um, how did you guys go about raising your children with the two different religions going on? Did you guys like introduce them to both and then see which one they wanted or? Yes, we introduced them to both. Um, I should preface this by saying that my grandmother on my father's side was Mennonite and my grandfather on my father's side was Lutheran and this was in small town Ohio uh, and her father, a very progressive thinking Mennonite, said to them when they got married, I don't care which church you go to, just go to the same church together. Now mind you, this was all the way back in the uh, 30s. 1930s, and I think that was sound advice at that point, and they decided to go to the Lutheran church because they realized that the method, the, excuse me, the Mennonite church was going gangbusters then, and actually still is to this day, and uh, in that small town of Ohio, and the Lutheran church was struggling. It's not struggling quite as much these days, but they felt that their presence would be more significant at the Lutheran church. Had they chosen to go to the Mennonite tradition, I can tell you I wouldn't be here because my dad then, being Lutheran, went to a Lutheran university, and that's where he met my mom. And if they hadn't met, obviously, I wouldn't be here. So 
it's a very existential question for us. Um, similar, somewhat uh, difference with your parents. Your dad was. Well, I think they were asking how they were. We raised our kids. Right, yeah. and in your in your parents' case, uh, it was a little bit different. Your My mom, mom was a convert. Right. Was a convert, and in our case, we had. My, my parents were both Lutheran, so we felt like it was important for them to see and experience both traditions and then at some point make up their own mind. And as you heard earlier, they made up their mind to go <laughs> to a side door with the, the Methodist tradition. Um, the one child was baptized in the Lutheran tradition, but then we encouraged her to consider First Communion in the Catholic tradition. And um, we, we kind of did back and forth like that. Uh, our middle daughter surprised us by saying that she wanted to be confirmed uh, in both traditions. And we thought, whoa, that's a kind of an interesting take. And because it's a sacrament in the Catholic Church, but it's not considered a sacrament in the Lutheran Church, in a strange kind of way, it wasn't, so to speak, double dipping. It was a sacrament in one tradition and a rite of passage in the other. And she, that was her, th this is how she kind of approaches a lot of things is by trying to find that middle way, being the middle child. But each child has sort of tried to figure out what makes sense for them, and we tried to provide them enough foundation as well as enough latitude to kind of come to terms with what works for them. Honestly, one thing that we did um, to make them feel more comfortable, um, I felt that if they had all gone through First Communion in the Catholic Church, they would never feel excluded if they wanted to go to Eucharist in a Catholic Church. But the other thing that happened was that there were many families in our parish that were either interfaith or ecumenical families. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, we had home-based religious education. Mm -hmm. And so we had a group of families that would meet together once every week or once every two weeks and do religious ed together. And all those families were either interfaith or ecumenical. And so it kind of normalized things and they could look at questions of the faith from the Catholic perspective with all of this diversity of opinions around too. And that made them feel very much at home. Um, if you don't mind answering, do you guys ever get into disputes because of the different ideologies of your religions? <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> 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 I, I would say that um, more of our disputes were owing to the fact that both of us are oldests <laughs> who come from oldests, who come from, out of the eight grandparents, five of them were oldests. And so there's anybody who knows anything about birth order and how much credence to give it know that the firstborns always know that they're right. So <laughs> <laughs> there was just, I think, a dynamic of that at work. Um, and then also I think the two of us growing in our own understanding of our faith journeys as well as our traditions and being able to see something of value in each other's traditions and not always feeling like we were trying to justify or apologize for our own tradition. And, and that took us some time, to be honest. But literally, I would say over the last third to whatever number of years of our marriage, it's become less and less of a thing because I think we've just Partly we've matured more and partly things have moved along in the ecumenical dialogues and um, uh, things like the home-based catechesis and uh, family camp and things like that helped give rise to not feeling like it was an all or nothing proposition one way or the other. Right. Good question. So kind of jumping back to what she said about how your guys' parents reacted, how was their reaction, like how did it affect your guys' marriages? Marriage, sorry. We were in charge of our wedding, so it didn't affect the wedding. We just made sure that both, both traditions got equal airtime, right? <laughs> um, Which meant, uh, in our case, um, her dad was a college administrator, and I was a student at that same college, and so we were able to use the campus chapel as a kind of a middle ground so that it wasn't in a Lutheran church or in a Catholic parish, but it was kind of able to be in a, a neutral territory. And that wasn't a perfect solution, but at least it helped move into a slightly more neutral zone. And um, we also were told by the Lutheran pastor <laughs> just go over to the Catholic Church and you know, have Monsignor McGovern 
uh, take you through the whole process of getting the uh, uh, dispensation of form for uh, not having a Catholic Catholic marriage because uh, it'll make it a whole lot easier and we Lutherans pretty much will just go along with whatever he is necessary so by one pastor stepping away not in a disinterested way but just in an easing of the burden way it really made things much easier both Pastor Trump and Monsignor McGovern were there at the ceremony. They both signed the marriage license, but technically speaking, Father uh, Monsignor McGovern was the officiant, and Pastor Trump was there as a kind of a secondary witness. I, I think one thing that's probably important to keep in perspective is that our parents were probably really pleased, were more pleased that we were still going to church and still being interested in being Christian then they were worried about us being different kinds of Christians, <laughs> right? So perspective helps. Um, I was just curious. Um, I was raised Catholic. I go to a Lutheran church. Is there a reckon? Have they come closer on who gets to go to heaven amongst these? <laughs> we're talking about communion, but ultimately we're talking about heaven. So. I, I don't know if Catholics have eased their interpretation of that or if Lutherans have, I don't know, if you could talk about that. Should we hand it off? Mm -hmm. I, I think that we have the best expert in the room that you could possibly ask, ask for um, in, in Catherine Johnson today. Yes, we agree on how you get to heaven. Do you want to say some more? <laughs> Neither tradition, at, at least at its best, has ever taught that only its own members are beloved of God eternally. And the Catholic Church has changed hugely on this so that it's explicit in teaching, certainly since Vatican II. And we Lutherans hold ourselves unable to limit the love of God, unable to draw the limits of that. So who knows? It may be as wide as all of God's creation. Right. The, the Catholics, Catholics have often given the impression, and this is one of the things that really exacerbated Luther's ire, that you could do a certain number of good deeds or pay a certain amount of money and be sure of getting in, right? Or at least assert, avoid a certain number of bad deeds and have a better chance. Um, but Luther's important insight is that God's power and love are infinite and we depend completely on God's power and love for our life and for our salvation. And the Catholic theology much more now explicitly agrees with that. It's God. Who does it? We don't. Okay, so whether it's Catholic or Lutheran or like Baptist and Methodist or anything like that, what's like one piece of advice or maybe a couple that you would give to people in a relationship who are two different religions or believers? Um, it's not by accident we have a slightly edgy uh, depiction of the Eucharist here and um, you know, throughout the scriptures, we read and hear of Christ welcoming the stranger and the one who would seem like the offensive guest to us in our sensibilities of who belongs and who maybe doesn't quite fit in. And Jesus, I think, is always trying to tell us that there's nothing we can do to not fit in, that, you know, there's nothing that is beyond the pale of God's love. And so I think that's a place to start with whatever relationship it is, uh, whether it's official ecumenical relationships or whether it's a uh, couple of folks who are trying to find their way in, in how they might shape and uh, build a permanent relationship. And uh, to always not let the sort of um, human institution rule over the God thread of love and acceptance and unconditional uh, love. And I think I'd just say, always ask questions with really open-minded curiosity of each other, right? Always appreciate and be curious. 
yeah, just ask why, how, how it is people do things, why, what they think, what it, what it means to them. We all love to be asked those things. Um, I think that's a really good point to um, transition now to um, our closing remarks by um, Dr. Uh, Jim Burke. Right, 